Well, good morning. Welcome to Stewart Congregational Church today. I'm ecstatic that you are here. A very special welcome to those that are watching online this morning. We're glad you with us are with us as well. How many of you have ever seen the TV show Jeopardy? Can I see your hands? How many of you have already decided that is not the game show you'd want to go on because you have to be smart to be on that show? All right. My sister was actually on a, a game show a number of years ago in the late 80s. Uh, she was on Wheel of Fortune. How many have ever seen Wheel of Fortune? All righty. How many think you can win a few dollars on that show? So did she. <laughs> Let's just say things didn't go her way. Uh, she uh, had a couple of bankrupts after building up a good amount of money, even knowing the answer. And uh, then she came to the very last one, and she just could not figure out what the answer was. It turned out that the answer was chicken pot pie. And uh, to this day... She has yet to have chicken pot pie <laughs> since that day. Uh, she said, I was so angry at chicken pot pie that I'll never have it again for the rest of my life. 30 years later, she has kept that promise so far. And uh, it's really great to be with you this morning. Uh, we've been away on vacation for the last couple of weeks, had a wonderful time. And I want to thank Sam and Chris Watson for all the help they were filling in to Epic Kids. Uh, Lynn looked at me a few moments ago and said, wait, you're here this morning. Who's with the kids? And I said, they'll be fine out there. Don't worry about it. And uh, so my wife is heading up Epic Kids this morning with a, a team out there. But Sam and Chris, thank you for uh, being such a blessing to our kids, to our church, and to me as well personally. If you've ever watched Jeopardy, it's interesting that uh, there are many times that they get on a roll to where they land the right categories and they can just answer question after question after question. Or actually, they can question the answers question after question after question, but sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. In just a moment, I want to show you a video of what to, seems to be a pretty easy category to many of us, but they just didn't have the right people for that category. Now, if you know the answers to these questions that they're about to show, by all means, feel free to call it out loud, but in the form of a what? Question. What is whatever it is, who is whatever. So let's, uh, let's have a little bit of empathy for these poor contestants that just got the wrong category. Uh, football 200. Your choice, do or don't name this play in which the quarterback runs the ball and can choose to pitch it to another back. What is an option? An option play. Ryan? <laughs> Uh, football, 400. I can tell you guys are big football fans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom Landry perfected the shotgun formation with this team. Who are the Dallas Cowboys? Dallas Cowboys. Uh, do you think we should go to commercial? <laughs> <laughs> Brian? Take it on to 600. Okay, by signaling for one of these, a returner can reel in a kick without fear of getting tackled. What is a fair catch? Fair catch. <laughs> Two clues left, Ryan. 800. These penalties are simultaneous violations by the offense and defense that cancel each other out. What are offsetting penalties? And they are called offsetting penalties. Let's look at the uh, $1,000 clue just for the fun of it. <laughs> Jimmy? As Minneapolis's U.S. Bank Stadium prepares to host Super Bowl 52, I'm looking at the Ring of Honor with names from this defensive line. They took the Vikings to four Super Bowls. Who are the purple If you guys <laughs> ring in and get this one, I will die. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the purple people eaters? We're going to take a break. I have to talk to them. <laughs> Folks, I really feel bad for these people. Let's give them one more chance, okay? We'll try to make it a little bit easier. We'll give them one more chance. Uh, football 200. Name this ball. <laughs> that is called a football. It's so fun to be able to splice and be able to mess with people with a video. While we're on that topic of football, how many are excited that it's football season? Can I see your hands? I thought I would never, ever get here. Um, a couple weeks ago, as Tim was preaching, he put a picture of uh, Foles, the quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars, on the screen. How many remember that? 
Okay, who remembers when Katie was up here a few weeks ago and she put a, a picture of <clears throat> Tom Brady up on the screen? Boy, talk about a, a, a person or a team that just divides people one way or the other. How many remember that, though? Can I see your hands? Tom Brady on the screen. Um, I've got a quarterback I'd like to put on the screen today. Of course, that's Aaron Rodgers of my Green Bay Packers. Love you folks out there. Very good. Now, you might be wondering this morning, why is Aaron Rodgers on the screen? What does he have to do with our message this morning, folks? Absolutely nothing. It's just my turn, and I want to put my quarterback up on the screen. You know, this morning, as we continue our series that uh, Pastor Tim started last week, Jeopardy! Questions That Matter, we saw last week that the answer to our first question was the good news that has restored us into a right standing before God and that made possible a right relationship with God, ourselves, others, and even creation. And of course, that question, who can remember? The question was, what is the gospel? Now, last week, Tim shared as he introduced our series, uh, Jeopardy! Questions That Matter, we saw five definitions that he pointed out that Paul shares in Colossians 1, verses 1 through 8. And the first one was grace. The fact that God reached down to an undeserving people to do for them what they could not do for themselves. Then he introduced the concept of peace, which is that settled state that results from being grasped for that grace and by that grace. Then he introduced trust, which is believing in the one that grasps us in that grace. And then love, which is God demonstrating his unconditional and unrelenting acceptance, affection, and attention. And then last, hope, which is faith in the future promises of the one that grasps us, which brings us today to our passage in Colossians chapter 1. And we'll be looking at verses 9 through 14. And the answer to today's question is that God wants us to have an ability to understand God's plan, and God wants us to have the power to experience his plan. And the question for today is, why are we rescued? Why are we rescued? How many of you are looking forward to heaven? Can I see your hands? Some of you, you had to take a while to think about it. No, we're looking forward to heaven. But folks, there is much, much more that we have to look forward to than just an eternity with Jesus in heaven. You see, when God demonstrated his love for us by taking the form of human flesh, by coming down to earth for 33 years and teaching, ministering, and serving others, only to die a cruel, torturous death on the cross, to rise again three days later. Yes, he did that. He rescued us so that we might have eternity with him in heaven one day. But God desires much, much more than that for us. Because God has given us exciting potential in this life. And God has rescued us so that we might experience all the potential here in this life. And before we delve into that, let's take a moment. Let's just ask God to meet with us this morning in a special way. Let's ask God to speak to our hearts. And let's ask God to help us this morning to see the reasons why God rescued us for this life. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning so grateful for the salvation that you did make possible. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can't spend eternity with you one day. But Father, you did so much more than that. You gave us the best life possible to live in this life. Father, thank you for all the potential that we have of experiencing you, of following your plan while we're on this earth. Father, open our eyes to all that you've given to us and prepared for us. Speak to us now in these few moments. And Father, I need you to do what I cannot do, to work in hearts this morning to draw people into a place of hope, to bring people closer to you and to help us be more like you. So, Father, I pray for your filling. Use me this morning for your honor and for your glory to be a blessing to these people. We ask these things in your name. Amen. While we're talking about the contrast between mediocre 
and all that God has for us and the potential. You know, there's no life worth living like the Christian life, is there? There's no life out there that has as much fulfillment, as much hope, as much possibility and potential as living the plan that God has laid out for us. But let's not delve into that quite yet. Let's live in the world of mediocrity for just a moment. I want to share with you the most mediocre joke I've heard in a long, long time. Have you heard that Julie Andrews will no longer, who knows Julie Andrews? Remember her, Sound of Music and others? Have you heard that Julie Andrews will no longer be endorsing cheap, generic dark shades of lipstick yeah she claims that it breaks too easily and makes your breath smell bad in a statement she said and i quote the super colored fragile lipstick gives me halitosis <laughs> i warned you okay i said it would be bad <laughs> but you know what though god has so fortunately so much more than mediocrity for our lives here in fact, before we even begin into our series, let's understand the context of what this passage is written for. You see, Paul has gotten some wonderful, wonderful news about this church at Colossae. He's heard from people that this church is full of people that are growing in their walks with God. They're hungry for God's word. They're eager to serve God. Their numbers are growing. God's doing some great things in and through the people of this church. But Paul has also heard that there is heresy spreading in the church. There are those that are spreading false doctrine. So Paul writes this book here, the book of Colossians, first of all, to encourage those that are living for God and trying to make an impact on their community. But he also writes this book as a warning about the false teaching that is out there. And part of this false teaching emphasizes the fact, and by the way, this false teaching would eventually lead into Gnosticism. But in this false teaching, it included the fact that it's all about knowledge, that there is a level of spirituality that they could only reach through knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge. But folks, as we look at this passage, Paul emphasizes that there's emptiness in mere knowledge alone. And Paul is encouraging these people, listen, knowledge is wonderful, but we need to learn to apply that knowledge to daily living. Because mere knowledge will not change a life. And Paul's prayer in today's text emphasizes two aspects of why God rescues believers from the power of darkness. He prays, first of all, that they would understand what God's plan for their lives is. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, folks, God has a plan for your life. It's not just about eternity, but God has a future on this planet that is exciting. And folks, you need to understand how God wants you to have the best life that's possible out there. But not only that they would understand what God's plan for their lives were, but also that they would have the power to do and experience God's plan for their lives. You see, knowledge, for the sake of knowledge alone, doesn't lead to a life that pleases God. And Paul makes it clear why God rescues believers from the three prayer requests that he actually prays in this passage of Scripture in Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14. He prays, first of all, that he wants people to understand that God rescues believers in order that we would have, number one, the ability to know God's plan. The ability to know God's plan. You see, God doesn't want us to go through life and just have to figure it out. But God's got a future out there. He's got a plan for us out there. And God says you will never be more fulfilled. You'll never experience more peace. You'll never be more satisfied in life than when we do God's plan for our lives. And notice he prays, first of all, for this group of believers for spiritual intelligence. Verse 9 says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. You see, when a person is born into God's family, he is given at that moment all they need to grow and to develop spiritually. 
Colossians 2 verse 10 says that we are complete in him. God gives us everything we need to grow into being spiritually mature believers and followers of Christ. And these people were going around, these false teachers telling people that there's something new out there. And they need to get a hold of something new and to develop, amongst other things, knowledge for knowledge's sake. And this group of uh, false teachers were trying to give people the idea and trying to teach that they, have, they had arrived spiritually. And the only way that they could arrive is to develop more knowledge. Well, spiritual maturity, spiritual growth towards genuine Christ-likeness is a lifetime pursuit of understanding that God wants us to look like him. God wants for you and for me to look like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to respond like Jesus would, to love the things that Jesus loved, to hate the things that Jesus hated, to treat other people the way that Jesus would treat them, and to have the values that Jesus had. And Paul uses the phrase, we ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. The word filled here means to be fully equipped. And the picture is that of a ship that is getting ready for a long, long voyage. And that ship is completely stocked. It is completely supplied. It's ready for that long voyage. And folks, in our case, our life is a long voyage, isn't it? Sometimes the sailing is smooth. Sometimes the seas get rough, don't they? And God desires that you and I would be prepared for this voyage, and they would make it a choice in our hearts to understand what God's plan for my life is, how he wants me to grow, what he wants me to be, and how he wants me to live. So how does this happen? How can we be full of his spirit? Well, listen to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 again. It says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. And how does the Spirit give that wisdom? Is it through vision? Is it through dreams? Is it through, no, it's through the word of God. And Paul pulls the curtain back on the Christian walk, as it were. And he lets us look behind the curtain of his life where he says in Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14, he said, not that I have already obtained, not that I've already obtained. Folks, if there were anybody here that we would say, let's put them on the spiritual platform. Uh, they really know what it's like to live the Christian life. That's a spiritual mature Christian. That's a person that's got it together. That'd be the Apostle Paul probably, wouldn't it? And even that person that we would say, he has really got it together. He gets the Christian life. God is pleased with his life. Even this person says late in his life, I've not obtained all this. I've not arrived at my goal. But he says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't count myself to have taken hold of it. I've not arrived yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the mark for the goal to win the prize for which God has called me in Christ. Notice that phrase again, though, in verse 12. He said, I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ has taken hold of me. And folks, that's what we're talking about this morning. In taking hold of the very essence of, of why God has rescued us. It's not just so we can walk around on clouds wearing halos flighting, you know, floating around in the sky someday, which is not an accurate perception of heaven, by the way. But God has rescued us so that we might be able to apprehend, to take hold of so much more in this life. Now, how did Paul do this? And if you take one thing away from this message, take this home. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he communicates his goal to the church of Philippi. Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know Christ. He said, that's the goal of my life. I want to know Christ. And the word know here, though, is not talking about a head knowledge in contrast to what the false teachers were teaching at Colossae. 
You see, this knowledge here, when Paul says, I want to know Christ, it's a knowledge through intimate investigation. It's a knowledge through experience. So what Paul is saying is not, I want to know about Christ. He's saying, I want to know Christ personally. How many of you have ever heard of a Bible quiz? Can I see your hands? Bible quizzing? A lot of churches do that. Bible quiz would be where we would set chairs across the front, and on each chair, it would have a little buzzer that would uh, detect which person stood up the first, and that person would get to answer the question. For example, if question number one would be, what is the first book of the Bible? Everybody would jump up if they knew the answer, and they would answer Genesis. So whoever came up with, uh, whoever was first out of their seat, whoever said Genesis first, then they got that point. And we could have, even in our church this morning, we could have a Bible quizzing <coughs> contest. And after we had elimination rounds, we could finally figure out who the one person is that probably knows the most about the Bible more than anything else. But folks, that does not mean that person is the most Christ-like in our midst. It does not mean that that person has allowed the, the, the Spirit of God to change their lives the most. That's just head knowledge. But real change takes place when we take head knowledge and allow it to change our hearts. We allow what we know about God's plan to change our lives. It changes our actions. It changes the way that we respond to where day by day we're in the process of getting to look more like Jesus Christ himself. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, don't be content with mere head knowledge. It's the application of the word of God. And we see here that <coughs> Paul is talking about the importance of experiencing all that God has rescued us for. You see, he wasn't telling them here to just know everything there was to learn. But he's telling them, listen, acquire the plan of God. Discover what God wants for your lives and then do it. Paul's first prayer is, that we see revealed here is that God rescued us that we might grow in him spiritually, spiritual intelligence, but also in verse 10, practical obedience. Verse 10 says, so that you might live a life worthy of the Lord to please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good word, growing in the knowledge of God. And two words we see here that have summarized the practicality of Christian growth in this passage. Number one, the word wisdom that we discussed above. In other words, find out God's plan. Understand wisdom. Apply knowledge to daily living, but also the walk that is the result of it. You see, this is not about working for God. It's not about trying to reach some level by what we do in order to get God's love and acceptance. No. But it's allowing God to work in us and through us in order to produce fruit that changes us and that serves other people. You see, you can't separate spiritual learning from spiritual living. And that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, so that we might make it our goal to please him. Paul says, I want my life to change so much. I want my heart to change to where my number one priority in my life is how can I please God? What choices can I make in response to temptation? Can I choose that pleases God? How can I invest my time and talents and treasures and energy and all that God has given to me? How can I use those to please God? You see, in our context here, in Colossians 1, 10 through 12, he gives four results of living this life that is pleasing to God. He says, number one, the result of allowing God to change our life is number one, we'll bear fruit. Number two, we'll grow. Verse 11 talks about being strengthened. Verse 12 talks about giving joyful thanks. And folks, sometimes it's not easy to give that joyful thanks. You look back on some of the tough times in your life and maybe what you're going through right now. And you might say, Craig, it's hard for me to give thanks right now. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the difficult. How can God expect me to give thanks in the middle of this mess, in the middle of this crisis? But folks, once we learn the plan of God for our lives, 
Once we commit to doing the plan of our lives, it allows us to say, God, I don't understand right now, but I'm going to let you have your will in this. I'm going to submit to whatever you're trying to do in my life right now. And Lord, I may never be able to figure it out until I get to eternity, but God, that's okay because I trust you, because I trust your plan, and I want to accomplish your plan, whatever that might be. So in addition to God rescuing us so that we can experience spiritual intelligence and practical obedience, he's rescued us in order that we might live moral excellence. Notice with me verses 11 and 12. To being strengthened with all power according to the glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Isn't that a life that each of us would like to live? A life of being strengthened. A life of great endurance. A life of patience. The word endurance and patience are often associated with each other. But in this context, great endurance literally means perseverance. To be able to keep on doing what we're supposed to do, even if others around us are not. To keep on keeping our eyes on Jesus, even if we don't understand what's going on in our life. That's the word endurance in this context. The word patience means a gentleness. It means a calm, sweetness, and peace. Folks, imagine being able to live that kind of life. That's God's plan for us, is that we might allow him to change our hearts and change our lives to where we can experience this endurance, this perseverance, experience this gentle peace that Paul is talking about. See, it's amazing how many Christians are satisfied, though. How many believers say, well, my goal is just to kind of survive this life, and then I'll enjoy heaven. No. God, exp- God, God desires so much more for us than that. And the question is this this morning. Are you and I living the life of excellence, which God has equipped us for, and which God has rescued us for? Notice in verse 12, this heart of joyful thanks that overflows from the life that's lived according to God's design. Verse 12, and giving joyful thanks to the Father. Why? Because he has qualified, he's made us competent, in other words, to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. God literally took us from the kingdom of darkness as twisted, as helpless, as hopeless as it was, and God took us rescued us from that, and delivered us into a whole new world, a world of light. And because of that, verse 12 of Colossians 1 says that now you and I are qualified to share in the inheritance of God's holy people. In other words, you and I can look back in the day where we didn't qualify for that. Our lives were hopeless. Our lives had no direction. Our lives was futile and going nowhere and was empty. But when Jesus rescued us from that and gave us a whole new kingdom to live for, everything changed, and now we are qualified. You're not just experienced heaven, but now we've been qualified to enjoy all the blessings of this life as well. How many of you here are Green Bay Packer fans? I heard a couple cheers a few moments ago. God bless you folks. I love you more than the other people, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, Thursday was a tough day. I hope, Sam, that you're enjoying yourself. He's an Eagles fan. They beat my Packers. Yeah. So there were several years ago where um, uh, the Green Bay Packers needed to raise some money to build an addition onto their stadium. They wanted to add some seating. They wanted to build an atrium, and, and the stadium is just beautiful right now. But Green Bay, their football team, the Packers, is a publicly owned team. There is no one owner. It's owned by shareholders. So the Packers, to raise money for this expansion program, decided to sell sell some more stock. They sold more stock, okay? (laughs) They sold shareholders lots of stock, okay? They decided to sell some more stock in order to raise money. And I heard about that, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to own a share of stock in the Green Bay Packers? Now, this stock can never uh, earn a profit. If I chose to sell it, I had to sell it back to the Green Bay Packers again. And so really, there's going to be no financial benefit whatsoever. It was just a souvenir to go on your wall. 
But man, it looks good in my office wall. It looks good. And every year, because I am an owner of a share of stock in the Green Bay Packers, and, and by the way, I'm a small, tiny little minnow in a large sea of thousands of stock owners, I'm one share. But every year, because I own that one share, I get a letter in the mail, and it's a proxy to vote for the board members of the Green Bay Packers. Every year, I get a kick out of getting this letter, and I know none of those names. I don't know who these people are. But I still am qualified now to vote as a stockholder of the Green Bay Packers. But before I bought that share of stock, I never got that letter. But now I do every year. Folks, that's a silly illustration of exactly what God has done for us. When God rescued us from this kingdom of darkness and brought us into this kingdom of light, he now qualified us to be able to participate in all the inheritance of God's eternal kingdom. Folks, that's amazing. We are now qualified. We're now competent to share in these things and giving joyful thanks to the Father. Why? Because he has qualified, he's made us competent to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And folks, that's not just talking about heaven one day. That's talking about you and I are now qualified to live the best life that's possible, and that's a walk with Jesus himself. That's the knowledge that the creator of the whole world is there for me, to see me through every problem I'll ever experience, to be by my side through every uh, change in my life. And folks, if God be for me, who can be against me? Romans chapter 8. If God is on your side, then what can be against you? In other words, you and I previously didn't qualify to be heirs. We were unfit to be participants in the inheritance. We were on the outside looking in, but now no longer. Now we're qualified to experience all the blessings that God has. Well, first we saw that God rescues believers in order that we might have the ability to know God's will, but also to have the power to do God's will. Colossians 1.13 indicates that at one point we were under the dominion of darkness. It says we were part of this dark, misguided, rebel kingdom that had us under its power. We were in its grips. We were under its control. Folks, we were helpless and we were hopeless. But that's not the last chapter. Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he's brought us into the kingdom of the sun. And God rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. He's transported us into this kingdom of light. The kingdom of King Jesus, the rightful king. And now we are able to experience what God designed our creation to be in the first place. And it's all due only to God rescuing us through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 5.19 says, For just as through the disobedience of one man, Adam, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, Jesus, many will be made righteous. And when Colossians 1.13 says, For he had rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son, he loves that little phrase right there. The Son he loves is a reminder just what our rescue cost, or just what it cost. Here's God the Father, deeply in love with his son, Jesus Christ. And he was willing still to give, because of his love for us, his son, that he loved, to come down to earth to experience a torturous death on the cross. Why? Because of his love that he has for us. And this little phrase at the end of verse 13, whom he loved, is a reminder of the tremendous cost of our rescue, the blood and the very life of his beloved son. Our passage concludes this morning in verse 14 with the words, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Again, the process of a rescue is emphasized here and uh, as we see the word redemption, means to rescue by a ransom. And folks, our emancipation that we're enjoying for heaven one day, for this life we live on this earth, is only because of the tremendous price that was paid 
by our rescuer who is so loved by his heavenly father. And folks, that rescuer has amazing plans for our lives. I heard the story. I'm in Dollar Tree all the time. How many of you go to Dollar Tree? That is a children's pastor's paradise, okay? All the stuff you can buy for a dollar for children's ministry. Uh, heard about, though, a, a mother who took her two kids to the Dollar Tree, and uh, the toddler wanted to get some glow sticks. And so the toddler just cried and cried and screamed, and you know, finally the mother said, okay, I'll get you some glow sticks. And that little toddler was waving the glow sticks as he walked around the store, took them out of the package, and he was so happy about that. And the older brother grabbed the glow sticks away from him. The mother said, give him back those glow sticks. Those are his glow sticks. And now he's crying, and he's all upset all over again. And the older son just grabs the glow sticks and begins to break the glow sticks. And he says, Mom, the reason I grabbed the glow sticks was not just so he would get angry, but I wanted him to enjoy all the potential of those glow sticks. He said, I wanted to see my brother wave those glow sticks around that are now glowing. And the little boy saw those, and he was just even more excited about the fact that, wow, look at these glow sticks. They're even better now. And you know, so many believers are just content with glow sticks that don't glow when it comes to daily living. And God rescued us not just so that we can go to heaven, but so that you and I can allow God to help us to experience all the potential of our lives. I hope this morning that an average mundane life is not what you're content with. Philippians 3.12, and I close with this verse, Paul saying, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on in order to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ has taken hold of me. God rescued us for a purpose. Let's take hold of all that God has rescued us for. Father, this morning as we come to you, we thank you for all the hope, all the help that we can experience. Because of your rescue, Father, we're overwhelmed at the cost that our rescue cost you. And we're grateful for the fact that not only do we have eternity with you in heaven, but Father, we can also experience the best life possible here. God, I pray that we would leave this place this morning with a renewed vision and passion about experiencing what Paul was talking about, to take hold of everything that you took hold of us to take hold of. Father, I pray that you'd be with someone here this morning that may be here and needs to take that step of getting a hold of your plan for their lives, or maybe following some step of obedience that would allow to your blessing in their, the way that you desire. But Father, I pray that we'll leave this place taking hold of the reason that you rescued us for. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we're blessed.
song this morning, just a reminder of what it costs our God.
in order to experience our freedom and our rescue. As he's given everything for us, let's make it a goal this week to give our all for him. Let's ask God as we leave to be glorified through our lives, as we allow him to change us into his image. As we ask God to use us to touch others around us for his honor and for his glory. This morning, if there's a need in your life, we want to be there for you. Perhaps you'd like to talk to someone regarding your relationship and your walk with God. Maybe you've got something going on in your life you'd like prayer for. Doris Clark is going to be in the front here. And she'll be available for you. Doris, raise your hand if you would. She'll be here for you. And let our Stevens minister for the day know how we can serve you. We love you, folks. We're glad you're here. And as God has great hopes for you, we as a family get to come together, together to experience his plan, not just for us as individuals, but as family of Stuart Congregational Church. One of my favorite passages of scripture, we're challenged to be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God bless you. Have a great day and a great week.